Hi, good morning and welcome and thank you for joining us here at Stonehouse Baptist Church online as we gather together to celebrate and worship this Easter Sunday morning. We are coming together to celebrate what is the greatest day in history, the day where the stone was rolled away, where the tomb was empty and where the angels declared, why do you look for him among the dead? For he is risen. He is risen indeed. Whoever you are, wherever you are, we are really thankful that you have chosen to mark this day with us and you are very, very welcome here. Whether you are young, somewhere in the middle, or a little bit older, welcome to you. Whether you are a regular in our church family, or this is your first time joining us, welcome to you as well. Whether you know the love of Jesus and have done for some time, or you are just taking those first tentative steps, you are all very welcome, whoever you are, wherever you are, and however you have come to be with us. We hope you'll be blessed. We hope you'll be encouraged. We hope that you will hear some of the Easter story and rethink what that might mean for you today as we gather together. If you are here for the first time or you're checking us out or you'd like to know more, please do drop us a comment below. We would love to stay in touch with you. We'd love to be able to reach out, to share with you, to pray with you, to serve you as best we can. It would be our pleasure and our privilege to get to know you better. Today is an incredibly special day for those of us who place our faith in Jesus Christ, for those of us who call Jesus our Lord and Saviour. For today, the day of days, is when we remember that moment when all of God's promises, every single one, was unquestionably undoubtedly, completely and irrevocably secured for us and for all time. This is the day where we say we know death was defeated, we know victory was guaranteed and we know that hope was assured. This is the day that we come together with Christians across the world and we proclaim he is risen, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. Friends, are you ready for Easter? Let's come and gather ourselves before God this morning. We were not eyewitnesses to the event, as were Mary and the disciples. We did not journey through a dangerous city seeking answers or consolation. We have not seen the angels who gathered at the tomb that morning, or wept in the garden because we could not find him. But we are here to attest to a story that has not lost its power during 20 centuries of change and conflict. We are here because those before us carried that story as if it were precious gold, cherished it as if it were the key to a hidden kingdom now revealed and made full in Christ. Sisters and brothers, take your places here today in celebration and in awe. What you are about to hear again has the capacity to change the world, and your very presence attests to the rising up of life from the tomb of despair and to the uncontrollable, unquenchable, unstoppable, irresistible power of God. It's 
Easter morning again and we celebrate together. We'll share now in some words of acclamation and I'd invite you to read those words which are in yellow and bold in response and there will be a little gap of space for you to do that. Alleluia, Christ is risen. We have not seen the risen Christ. We have not seen Jesus face to face. In faith we come, in hope we arrive to celebrate and proclaim the wondrous truth. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Amen. In these times where we are worshipping in our own homes and our own places, it has been somewhat difficult for us to be able to share in sung worship, something we would normally be doing a great deal. However, we are blessed because the wonderful folks over at Resound Worship have made a video available for us this morning. And this is a wonderful song, a fantastic and powerful song that declares the truth that we are here to proclaim, that Christ was was raised. So will you join? Raise your hands, raise your voices if you can as we join with Sam Hargreaves who is the writer and one of the performers of this song. Christ was raised.
And so we come now to a time of prayer and we bring ourselves before the throne of glory where God sits with Christ at his right hand. And we reach out in confidence, knowing that because of Jesus, because of his sacrifice on the cross, because of his resurrection, because he is ascended now and seated with the Father, and because of the Father's great mercy and great kindness and great, great love of his creation, that he hears our prayers and acts on our behalf. There will be some time in between sections of this prayer for you to speak out your own words of prayer, your own petitions, your own intercessions, your own requests to God. And I encourage you to do this, knowing and holding fast to the truth that God hears each and every voice whether lifted aloud, spoken in the quiet of your hearts, or even those things that you cannot quite give voice to. For we declare that the Holy Spirit intercedes in those situations on our behalf. So let us come before God. We bring ourselves now, assured Lord, of your love for us, so vividly and powerfully demonstrated by the sacrifice of Jesus on that wooden cross. We thank you for giving your Son, for reaching down to rescue and redeem us when we had turned so far from you. God of life, this morning we rejoice in the resurrection of your son, his defeat over death and his gift of new life. And we come to you as the author of all things, the giver of new life and hope. And we bring our prayers in confidence and in sure certainty. Lord, we now speak our prayers for your creation. Lord, we declare that you are ruler of all, sovereign over the entire earth, and we come to you in sorrow. Sorrow that our greed and selfishness have caused so much suffering in your creation. We recognise, Father, that we have so often sought our own comfort, our own luxury over caring for the world that you created for us. So, Father, help us to live our lives in new ways, enabling us and equipping us and stimulating us to care for the earth that you call us to protect as stewards and priests. Give us bold voices as we speak out against the destruction and plundering of the bountiful resources you have blessed us with. And so now we pray for the nations of the world. Father, as the world continues to grapple with the spread of COVID-19, we hear and join our voices with the cries of those who lament and who are sorrowful, those who call to you, begging you to intercede, and those who worship you, and those who mourn their losses towards you. We join our voices with them in solidarity. Lord, guide and protect all of those who are putting their lives at risk to care for others and help us to be strong enough, wise enough to follow the guidance of those who are seeking and working to limit the spread of this virus. Father, for those places where healthcare and basic necessities are lacking, we pray that you will give us compassionate and generous hearts and help us to give, to support, and to make sure that those places are no longer places where they do not have enough. Father, we pray so much that when all of this is past, that when we can gather together, we will embrace all people, 
that we will see our sisters and brothers across this world in the same way that you do, as beloved children who are created in your image. Wonderful Father, we pray for a uniting of the world in your light and for your sake. And so, Lord, we now pray for our own country and its leaders. Father, we lift this land to you. We lift the leaders of this nation to you. We give thanks to you for the continued healing of our Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And we pray that you will strengthen and enable him to continue working to serve this country, leading us through this time of crisis. Father, we thank you for all of those who have given so selflessly, all who lead with compassion and seek to serve the people in these challenging times. We pray for encouragement and strength for all who are in positions of leadership, influence and power. And Lord, we pray that you will shine light into their lives, filling them with mercy and love and compassion, causing them to do good works for other people, seeking to serve, seeking to help and seeking to bring peace and comfort to all who are afflicted. Father, we thank you for our NHS. We thank you for the tireless work that all are doing within that organisation to bring healing and the difficult times they face. Lord, protect them and guide them. Father, for the United Kingdom, we pray that this will be a time of coming together even though we are separated and a time where your light may shine brightest into the darkness of people's lives. And as we think of our country, Father, we now turn our thoughts to our own communities, not just here in Stonehouse, but the communities of those who have joined with us this morning, the places we know, the places that we love. Father, we lift our communities, our places where we live and work, those places where we love and worship, to you this morning. We say, come, Lord Jesus, and have your way among us. Work in powerful and mighty ways across our neighbourhoods and beyond. Lord, be with those who we cannot be with. Bring comfort and assurance and peace and protection and guidance and love to them. Father, we know that your hand is upon all people and your eye is never, ever diverted from anywhere or any place. So, Lord, protect us, guide us, keep us. May you bring us out from harm and hurt and may you inspire us to selflessly serve and, and help those around us. Lord, we come to you in humbleness, begging and asking you, guide us and look after our communities and into those communities help us to be beacons of light and hope. And as we think of this, Lord, we pray now for our churches. Lord, we lift our churches to you, knowing that they do not belong to us, but they are yours. They are your bride and you have made the church to reflect your glory. And so, Father, we pray that we give up our thoughts of ourselves and we turn entirely to you, that we may bring majesty and honour and glory to your name. And Father, in these days where darkness and despair seem so close, 
we pray that your church will rise up as a voice of light and hope. Will you equip us and enable us to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus, to share your love and to witness to your great mercy and kindness, the same mercy and kindness we have felt poured into our lives. Lord, in particular, we pray for those churches who are struggling in these times. We pray for the leaders, the worshippers, the ministers, the staff, all who are trying their best to continue serving you and to continue serving their communities, worshipping together in these strange circumstances. In this uncertainty and in these difficulties, we ask for your peace, your presence and your provision. Help those who are providing to know that what they offer is a pleasing act of worship to you. Father, we pray now for those who we know who have particular needs at this time. Lord, for those we have named, for those whose names we do not know, for all those who are in need, whether physical, spiritual, emotional or otherwise, we pray that you will strengthen and encourage. We pray that your presence will be very real and felt in people's lives. Lord, bring helpers to those who are in need. Make sure that they are not alone. Make sure, Father, that there are people around who will serve, who will help, who will care and who will love. And Father, we ask for healing, hope, comfort, joy, guidance and security for all your children. And Father, as we have thought of the world, as we have thought of nations and as we have thought of others, we now pray for ourselves. Lord, in this time, we lift our names to you and we pray that you will be with us, that we will know your hand upon us, that we will know your strength within us, that we will know your peace surrounding us. God, who stills the waters and quiets the storm, God, who lets not a hair of our heads fall without your knowledge, God, who brings sight to the blind and words to quieten tongues, God who created the earth and all that is in it, God who teaches the foolish and strengthens the wise, God who promises a coming day where there will be no more mourning or crying or pain, when death will pass away and all things will be made new. Lord, we ask you, bring healing to our worlds, to our neighbours and to us. Bring wisdom so that we may honour you and bring glory to you in these days of plague. Bring strength so that we may rejoice in your love. Bring patience that is grounded in living your way. Bring hope that is rooted in your good news of peace and shalom. Bring grace and calm so that we may bring grace and calm to others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray these things and we share these words together saying the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Would you please join me and read the words in bold and yellow again. Risen Christ, when darkness overwhelms us. When fear paralyses us. When grief torments us. When memories haunt us. When justice fails us. When apathy stagnates us. 
when courage leaves us. When despair grips us. And when death threatens us, may your resurrection light lead us. Amen. Jesus did and Jesus loved to show us how his father loves. When Jesus was all grown up, he really did a lot of stuff. On top of high hills and in boats out at sea, sat down by tables for supper or tea. But he also loved lots on a kind of tree. It's 100% true and a super cool story. Jesus said and Jesus loved to show us how his father loves. On a great big hill, Jesus told a story about two builders. Let's call them Billy and Bernie. Billy, being silly, built his house on the sand, but Bernie the brains built on rock on the land. After the storm, Billy was grumpy because his house was in pieces, all broken and lumpy. But when you listen and do what I say, you're like Bernie the builder who built the right way. Jesus did and Jesus loved to show us how his father loves. Jesus was by a lake with friends and people came to follow. It got late and bellies grumbled because they had no food to swallow. So Jesus did a miracle. 5,000 mouths were fed. He did it with two smelly fish and just five loaves of bread. In a boat, out at sea, his mates had a big surprise. They saw Jesus walk in there. They couldn't believe their eyes. He wasn't in a boat and he wasn't wearing skis. He was walking on the water and doing it with ease. Jesus served and Jesus loved to show us how his father loves. Jesus was at a table with friends like John and Pete. He made some soapy water and scrubbed their grubby feet. You can't wash my feet, says Pete. No way, not happening, never. But Jesus did the messy jobs, though he's the most important ever. Jesus ate and Jesus loved to show us how his father loves. Jesus was having supper. He broke the bread in two. It's a picture of my body and it's broken now for you. He also filled a cup with wine. Remember when I'm gone that I bled because I loved you and paid for all your wrong. Jesus prayed and Jesus loved to show us how his father loves. Jesus was in the garden. He knew his time had come. I wish there was another way, but let my father's will be done. Jesus died and Jesus loved to show us how his father loves. Some didn't like Jesus. He said he was God's son. They thought he was telling fibs and telling them for fun. And though he was God's son, they nailed him to a tree. In between two robbers, he died for you and me. He said it is finished. And then he closed his eyes. And in case he was pretending, they even stabbed his side. Jesus rose and Jesus loved to show us how his father loves. A woman was at a graveyard. A man asked her what was wrong. The lady sobbed and sniffled. Jesus' body's gone. She thought he was a gardener, but there was no spade in view. But Jesus called her Mary. Then teacher, she cries, it's you. So now Jesus is alive. There's lots he wants to give. But most of all, it's life and love. So we can really live. We share now in an acclamation, a profession, a confession, if you will, of our faith, of the things we believe. And this is inspired by Acts 22. And I'm grateful to the folks over at Engage who have provided this for us to use this morning. So will you read with me the words that will come up on your screen now? We believe in Jesus of Nazareth. 
shown to be from God by his signs and power, handed over to us in the plan of God, crucified by our sinful hands. We believe in Jesus Christ, raised by God from the dead, freeing him from death's power. It was impossible for death to hold him. We believe in Jesus the Exalted, ascended to the right hand of God, who received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured this Spirit on his people. We believe, we repent, we receive God's forgiveness. We believe, we rejoice, we receive God's Holy Spirit. Amen. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. What does Easter mean to you? It's a question that perhaps you've been asked or thinking about recently. What does Easter mean to you? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to us? Now, depending on who you are, depending on who you ask, the answer to that question probably changes. For some, maybe it's all about bunnies and chocolate and lamb and other sweet treats. For others, perhaps it's a long bank holiday weekend spent sorting out the house or the garden. For others still, perhaps Easter is just another four days. It makes no difference to their lives whatsoever. Yet, for around two billion people across the world who call themselves Christians, people who profess that they follow Jesus, that they have faith, for us, Easter is the most significant, the most important, the most powerful day of the whole year. We are reminded of God's love for us in the most profound and very real way as we look to an empty tomb, as we join a group of mourning women, as we encounter a heavenly messenger telling us that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. On this, the day of days, we celebrate the fact that God's promises have been assured and are fulfilled. We raise our voices in triumphant cries of Alleluia as the mystery and the majesty of events of that first Easter morning are remembered and are relived. We come to the empty tomb, perhaps in mourning, perhaps uncertain, perhaps with doubt. And we find ourselves confronted with the reality that Jesus, who had been crucified three days before and buried in the tomb, is no longer there. The stone has been rolled away. The funeral clothes lie on the floor. Jesus has risen. 
He is not in the tomb. This is one of the most significant, if not the most significant thing we can ever hold on to, we can ever confess, we can ever claim for ourselves. We stand in amazement as an angelic messenger comes and says to us, why do you search for him among the dead? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Perhaps our deepest hopes, our deepest longings, our firmest wishes are confirmed that the man who died on the cross on Friday was everything he said he was and just as he promised he has returned on the third day risen from the grave conquered death once and for all for this easter sunday we remember these things we remember that the things we thought about life the things we held firm to the things we thought were true are turned upside down by Christ, for death no longer has the final word. The empty tomb means something of universe-shaking significance for all of humanity. And it is a promise that we can each be the recipient of if we come to God in faith, if we believe, if we place our faith and our trust and our hope in the Son of God. Then we inherit this astonishing promise that has been secured and demonstrated in the empty tomb. This morning we'll be using Luke's account of that first Easter morning and we find this in chapter 24 of his gospel. If you've got a Bible to hand, if you have got uh, an app or you are accessing this text on the internet or however you're getting hold of the word of God this morning, please turn to that page right now. Turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and we're going to be thinking of verses 1 to 12 most significantly this morning. A group of women woke up early that morning the first day of the week, ready to anoint the body of Jesus. The previous night they had prepared the oils and spices according to custom and law, and in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their mourning, they made the journey to the tomb of Joseph, where the body of Christ had been laid. These were women who had known Jesus, who had shared their lives with him, who had walked with him, who had been touched by him and moved by him. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, each of these women had a role to play in Christ's story and Christ had a significant role to play in their stories as well. And they arrive at the grave ready to perform their solemn duty. And they're met with a most unexpected sight. They've come to prepare the body respectfully, the only way that custom allowed them to. And yet instead of finding the tomb sealed, Jesus' body resting inside, the stone has been rolled from the entrance and the tomb is empty. We're told that they were wandering in amazement at what might have happened. The body of Jesus, the one they had seen die only three days before, was gone. Jesus was dead. And his followers might reasonably have expected that that was the end of his ministry. But it was not. The discovery of the empty tomb, though, did not lead to an immediate and easy change in perspective. There was no moment before the angelic messenger came where one of the women turned to the other and said, I wonder if, I wonder if what Jesus told us is true. Though these women had witnessed the miraculous events of Jesus' life, though they had heard his teaching, though they had seen him casting out demons, healing the sick, walking on water, calming a storm, raising Lazarus from the dead even, the rules are the rules. When you die, you remain dead. What is left for those living is mourning and respect, remembrance and meditation on the life that has been and gone. 
And maybe, maybe your life is changed by the encounters you've had. But the encounters are past, and we certainly would expect no new ones. But if we remain in that place, if we remain in that mindset, we miss the fundamental message of Christianity. You can read the Gospels, you can travel with Jesus and only go so far. And so often this is what we do. We walk with Jesus through his life. We walk with him into his final days. We accompany him to the cross and we leave him there. We profess that he died for his sin, for our sins. And then taking the view that the only proper course is to respect and to hallow the name of the one who died for us, we enshrine him further and further into the tomb of our own memories. We think of Jesus as an insightful prophet, as a fiery teacher, as a merciful healer, as the one who was kind and compassionate and loving to all he met, the one who gathered together the lost, the lowest and the least, the one who reached out to those whom society had rejected or hated. We read his stories. We listen to his parables, we sit at his feet while he teaches and we marvel at the amazing miracles that he has performed. We follow him to the upper room and take the last supper with him. We sit with him in the garden of Gethsemane as he prays. We stand and watch at his trial. We are witness to his suffering. And we walk with him to the cross at Golgotha. And then we leave him there. The sacrificial lamb, crucified and given for us. And perhaps we think that's enough. Perhaps that is all we know of faith, that Jesus Christ died for us. So we remember him. We consecrate and sanctify his name. We let his blood wash us clean of our wrongdoing and we let his death restore us back to the father. But the story doesn't end at the cross. Our faith doesn't end at the cross. It begins at the cross. As significant as that moment was, as earth shatteringly important as that moment was, as profound and powerful and magnificent a declaration and a vivid demonstration of God's almighty self-giving love for humanity, it is not the end of the story and we should not leave Jesus there. For three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. His tomb was empty. The Lord had risen and in this moment the great promise of God is completely sealed and guaranteed as a reality for all who come to him in faith. We declare that in dying Christ defeated death and we proclaim <clears throat> that in rising Christ guarantees us our own resurrection into eternal life. He shows us the truth of the promise that in Christ there is no death. While our time on earth will pass, the resurrection of Jesus promises to us that we will also experience resurrection life. We will be brought into paradise where we will be forever with our Lord. We will come before the throne of God. We will walk with him. We will worship together with the choir and the saints of angels and Christians and believers through all history. He had always planned this for his creation. This is not the way that things are. The way that the world is now is not the way God planned it. And Christ's resurrection, his rising from the dead three days after his crucifixion is the guarantee of that promise of the way things are going to be. The restoration of how God imagined, created and desired the world to be. We will be reborn and we will spend an eternity in the presence of Jesus and of God. How is that truth sitting with us this morning? How are we doing with that? Do we recognise? Do we know? Do we worry that sometimes we walk with Jesus to the cross and forget that he rose three days later? 
Christians are a resurrection people. We live in the truth of that reality and we rejoice in it and we celebrate it and we proclaim our alleluias because of it, because it is the greatest and most momentous event in all of history. The greatest promise of God. This is what the empty tomb signifies. This is the message that the angels bring. I've sometimes thought reading this story that wouldn't it have just been easier if Christ himself was sat waiting outside the tomb that morning, robed in glory, a smile on his face, his arms thrown wide as he welcomed the bewildered women into his presence and showed them who he truly was. This is not, of course, the way things were. The women instead met two men who were clothed in uh, garments that gleamed like lightning, angelic messengers who came to deliver the good news of what happened this morning. And that is what we are called to step into. We as Christians are not called to stay mourning with the women, but to become messengers. And here's the truth. It is not the messenger that matters but the message that is being given. We have not seen the risen Jesus, but we attest to the reality of who he is. And we do that not just in what we say, but in how we live, who we are, what we say, what we do, what we think, how we act. Those of you who have heard the good news, perhaps you remember who told you, perhaps you remember how it felt. There's a truth in here about what it is to be a Christian. And it's a truth that flies in the face of all that the world teaches us about ourselves, about our individual importance. You see, being a Christian, it's not really about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. It, it's just not about us. It's not an individual thing that's designed for our personal satisfaction and gratification. Yes, Jesus died so that we could be redeemed. Yes, Jesus' blood washes us clean and brings us back to the Father. But it's not about us. It's about the message. It's about hope. It's about love. It's about that deep, self-giving, powerful love of the Father that caused him to reach out into the world, into a world that had completely turned its back on him. It's the love of the Father who gathers the lost. It's the love of the Father who reaches out to the broken and brings them back to him. Yes, Christ died for us. Yes, Christ's resurrection is a guarantee for us. But the moment we start thinking that it is just for us, that's when we stop living lives of authentic Christian witness. And we become everything that Jesus fought against in his earthly ministry. You see, Jesus didn't come just for a select few. He did not give himself over to the cross, nor rise from the tomb, just for a few individuals who were and are in the know. He did not come for the powerful or for the famous and the rich, the good looking, the influential, the best dressed, well spoken, most capable, most able, most popular. Throughout his time here on earth, Jesus was indiscriminate about who he blessed, who he associated with, who he showed love to, who he called back to the Father. The fact is this, Jesus didn't go to the cross for any one individual, but for all of humanity and for all time. And rising from the grave, he didn't guarantee eternal life for one specific group who were worthy of this amazing gift. He guaranteed it for all who would come in faith, profess their belief, confess him as Lord and believe in God. That's what we have to do. That's what we have to profess. That's what we have to proclaim. Come to Christ and believe. Trust and place your hope in him, knowing that in him you are redeemed and restored to God. Guaranteed eternal life with the creator father who loves and has given of himself for you. So if you're here this morning 
If you're here and you haven't made that leap, that you haven't taken that confessional step, you haven't made that profession of faith, then there is no better time. There is no better place than right here and right now to do that. You don't have to say any special words. You don't have to do anything particular. You just have to confess in your heart and know in your mind, in your soul, in your heart, in your body that this is true. Jesus died for you and rose again to guarantee you eternal life because God the Father loved. God the Father loved so much that he gave his only son for you. And friends, if you are someone who already believes, then here is a challenge. This message, this promise of Jesus, it's not just for you. Jesus is not a secret we have to guard closely, as if somehow there's only enough forgiveness and resurrection power for a very limited number of people. We are called to share the good news of Christ, to bear witness to him in the world, to go forth, to make disciples of all nations, baptising them in his name. Because the message we have to bring is the greatest message ever. It's the most powerful, the most important, the most significant, most incredible, most wonderful, most brilliant message that anyone could ever hear. Jesus Christ is risen he is risen indeed. The Easter miracle is God's last word in creation. Here, the victory over death is the conclusive and definitive act of our loving, mighty Father. And we are called out of our old beliefs, our old ways of living and thinking, and into a whole new reality, a whole new way of existing because of it. A life that knows that while death is real, it is not the end. It is not the final word. It's a life that proclaims that Jesus is alive and points to him in every act, deed, thought and word. It's a life where we are reborn through Christ's resurrection and can claim our inheritance as priests and co-heirs with Jesus. God's offer to us is life. Life in all its abundance. Life eternal. Through Christ, God gives this gift willingly. God gives this gift freely. Why would we choose anything else? How could we choose anything else? So friends, let's live in this declaration and allow it to sink deeply into our hearts. Let it shape and guide us. For it is a declaration of hope, a declaration of love, a declaration of wonder and power. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. Well, we don't want to leave you hanging with the story at the end of Luke 12. And so a couple of familiar faces to those of us here at Stonehouse are going to help us to finish off the story. David is going to read to us first from verses 13 to 27, and then Julian from 28 to 35. 
on the road to Emmaus. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said, he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope and pray that it has been a time of encouragement, a time of nourishment, a time of reawakening and reigniting your faith.
We hope that if you are new, if you are exploring, that you have found something deep and profound this morning, that Jesus has touched your life, that God has spoken to you, that the Spirit has moved greatly within you. And if you would like to keep in touch with us, please, we'd love to hear from you. And you can reach out to us in several ways. So you can get hold of us, firstly, by visiting our website. That's www.stonehousebaptist.com. .org.uk. You can email us on contact at stonehousebaptist.org.uk or you can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Stonehouse Baptist. Please do reach out to us. Do let us know what is going on in your lives. Let us know how this Easter has been for you. And if you have any testimonies of God's, God at work, we would absolutely love to hear from you. I'd also like to invite you to join us for our online services and events. We absolutely love being with you and being able to serve you in this way. And we promise that for as long as this quarantine lasts, for as long as we are uh, in lockdown and engaged in social distancing, we will be here. We will be here to serve you. We will be here to worship with you, to share God's word, to pray for and with you. We will serve you as best we possibly can and it would be fantastic if you would join us again. Next Sunday, we are kicking off a whole new series. We'll be looking at the fantastic letter to the Ephesians. And uh, that is a really powerful, profound uh, letter that speaks very deeply to what it is to be the Church of Christ in this modern age. So please come and tune in, come and join us for that. We'll be beginning that next Sunday. That's the 19th of April at 11 o'clock, firstly over on Facebook and then a little later on our YouTube channel. And you can find that by searching for Stonehouse Baptist Church on YouTube. So subscribe, give us a follow, give us a like. We'd really be delighted to stay in touch with you. Let's finish with a short prayer and a blessing. I'd like to pray for you all that you know the presence, you know the power, you know the very real peace and love of Jesus in your lives in this week. Wherever you are, whoever you are and whatever your circumstances, we pray that the spirit will be with you and among you, lifting you and keeping you safe. We pray for comfort and joy, for peace and presence. We pray that all good things will be with you and that you will come to know and love Jesus and feel the Holy Spirit and come to worship the Father deeper and in a more profound way in the week to come. And we say as Christ burst forth from the tomb, May new life burst forth from us and show itself in acts of love and healing to a hurting world. And may the same Christ who lives forever and is the source of our new life keep your hearts rejoicing and grant you peace this day and always. Amen. <laughs>